Good afternoon, and welcome to the virtual Prostate Summit, brought to you in partnership with Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. My name is Dr. Tony Schaefer, and you're tuned into the session called Making Sense of the NCCN Guidelines and Other Evidence for Castrate-Resistant Prostate Cancer. And I'm here today with Dr. Gary McVicker. Before we get started, I'd like to remind our audience that we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation. And you can send us your questions through the box in the lower left-hand side of your screen. Gary is a assistant professor of medicine and hematologic oncology at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine, and has, complete, has completed his fellowship and residency at the University of Michigan Health Systems. And clinical interests include kidney, bladder, prostate, and other genital urinary malignancies. And we've really enjoyed working with him over the last uh, years to help our patients with these conditions. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. Um, so um, the point of the session today, I wanted to um, sort of review the uh, NCCN guidelines and specifically sort of apply a case presentation to the guidelines, focusing primarily on men with metastatic prostate, uh, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So starting with the first case, we have a 70 year old man who has a history of prostate <coughs> cancer. And he had a prostatectomy 10 years ago and at surgery had Gleason um, 7 disease. Um, unfortunately, he developed a biochemical recurrence, so PSA only disease subsequent to his surgery and treated initially with salvage radiation, um, but again, had a biochemical recurrence. And so he was placed on androgen deprivation therapy. And so he presents now um, um, on uh, uh, Lupron or Lupralide, um, and his PSA is rising currently at six. He has a doubling time of about 14 months, and his, his serum testosterone is down in the castrate range. In terms of Im imaging, he's had both a bone scan and a CT scan completed, and these uh, show no evidence of metastatic disease. So I'd like to ask the audience, you know, what would you do for this man? Um, put him on a clinical trial. Um, just watch him or observe him. Think about secondary hormonal manipulations um, or move to one of the therapies that we talked about in the prior session, Cipulis LT, Docetaxel, Cabazitaxel, Abiraterone, Enzalutamide, or Radium-223. So we'll be looking forward to the uh, answers. And um, when you think of these patients, uh, how many men do you see now progressing about to this stage? Um, plenty, and yeah. So that's uh, something that we're seeing more and more of as mm -hmm. we identify more men with cancer and, mm -hmm. and they present to you. Correct. It looks like the voting is coming in very solidly uh, on the screen here and it's uh, secondary hormone therapy is what about 95% of the audience uh, is thinking about, Gary. Mm -hmm. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, so that would be a reasonable choice. So the NCCN guidelines, what their recommendations would be are listed here. And the preference would be to consider a clinical trial and then reasonable other options if a trial is not available um, would be um, observation. It would be important in this uh, scenario to maintain um, castrate levels of testosterone though. Um, and then to think about secondary <coughs> hormonal therapies. So an antiandrogen, or changing and adding or changing an antiandrogen, going through a period of antiandrogen withdrawal, considering ketoconazole, um, which would be suppressing androgen or adrenal androgen production, adding steroids, or thinking about um, estrogen compounds. All of these would be reasonable um, options. None um, are proven, one being better than the other. Um, none really proven to impact on overall survival, but can um, help men clinically. So the goal here would be, he's asymptomatic though, so let's so, just stop for a second yeah. and ask the question, if survival's not gonna be impacted and there presumably are some minor uh, side effects, when so would you think, think about yeah, doing this? Yeah, so you're, you're, I think you're thinking correctly. Um, I would agree entirely with you that whatever you do, you know, quality of life and, um, um, you know, uh, what can happen toxicity wise is important to consider. So really, you know, clearly chemotherapy is not listed as an option here. 
Um, these are generally high functioning men. Um, you know, many of them are working if they're young enough to be working, but at, lead active lives. And so you really, if you're going to intervene, um, I think you need to balance that um, intervention with um, potential um, toxicities um, with the therapies. That's a very important point. Okay. Um, so moving on to a second case, um, we have a 75-year-old man who also has a history of prostate cancer. He too had surgery about eight years ago and did well up until about two years ago when he was found to have metastatic disease. And he presents now on an LHRH agonist, um, but his PSA is rising. It's currently 20. Um, and he, uh, too, has castrate uh, serum testosterone levels. His uh, physician orders a CT scan and a bone scan, and he's found to have metastatic disease, um, but um, it's all skeletal metastases, and he's asymptomatic. So a question that I think is important is, um, you know, these men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, which this guy would have, right? He has. Um, castrate levels of serum testosterone, but a rising PSA um, in the face of good uh, androgen deprivation therapy. Should these men be maintained in terms of their serum testosterone levels in the castrate range? So should they continue an LHRH agonist or an antagonist? So let's get the input from the audience. And I do have a question here, Gary. A gentleman asked whether any genetic information from the prostate cancer cell specimens can be used in your sinking either here or later on in your, in your, in your selection process? Yeah, currently, no. Um, we hope to be able to personalize this a bit better in the future, but currently, um, that's not a, um, you know, a real-world clinic option. Okay. Um, but certainly, um, items that people are working on. Okay. So, overwhelmingly, 100% uh, said true. Yeah, and that would be the correct answer. And that's in line with the NCCN guidelines, that men, whether or not they have metastatic or if just PSA only, but castrate-resistant prostate cancer, their serum testosterone levels should be maintained in the castrate range. Um, and that's really based on uh, retrospective data that suggests um, an improvement in overall survival, the lower testosterone levels are. And certainly with the new hormonal agents that have become available, enzalutamide and abiraterone, they've taught us that androgen receptor signaling and maintaining low testosterone levels is important in this okay. disease. Um, so for this man, he's asymptomatic, um, bone metastases, um, rising PSA on hormonal therapy, um, what treatment option would you choose? A clinical trial, observation, but continuing um, his current androgen deprivation therapy, secondary hormonal therapies, and then moving on to the newer agents. Um, well, docetaxel has been around for a while, but Cepulis LT, Cabazitaxel, Abiraterone, Enzalutamide, or Radium-223. Well, it's another easy one. It looks like um, it's going to be Cepulosotel uh, T, about 57% mm -hmm. or so of the, of the group and voted for that. And the secondary uh, choice here is secondary hormonal therapy. Yeah. So um, in terms of the NCCN recommendations for men who are asymptomatic with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, remember we define uh, men being asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic if they're not requiring opioids for um, bone pain. So um, both answers would be correct per the NCCN guidelines. And so Cepulis LT uh, would certainly be one option. Secondary hormonal uh, therapies, um, and several are listed here, um, would be um, something that we would think about. Docetaxel, we tend to uh, uh, try to uh, limit that to men who are symptomatic, but in the trials, uh, asymptomatic men were included. And then a clinical trial um, would be a reasonable option for this population as well. Karen, let me just ask, uh, does the amount of bone burden uh, have any bearing on this? I mean, when, when do you pull the trigger? Yeah, in terms of <coughs> chemotherapy just, or well, just your choice? initiating this plan. Yeah, um, so I think that um, the amount of, um, well, I think there are a few clinical um, characteristics here. The key one that the NCCN highlights is um, symptoms, but certainly burden of disease would come into play if men are, you know, clearly progressing more rapidly, okay. um, you know, as opposed to um, people with more indolent disease, you know, people who are progressing more rapidly, maybe you might think of um, something um, 
that would have maybe a little bit more activity to it, so docetaxel okay. or um, you know hormonal therapy, um, as opposed to cell T, which probably has a more indolent mechanism. Of so action. a, a take-home message here is that Gary's uh, thinking along the lines of how much disease is present on the bone scan and. And, and maybe uh, how much is, or rapidly is it changing? Yeah, and I, that think, may, I think uh, rate of change would be more important as opposed that's to an the excellent, amount. excellent point. Yeah. So just to highlight Sapula Cell T um, for a moment, this is a little bit of a different um, therapy than what we've had in oncology in the past. And it's a fairly involved process. It requires that men um, on the left of the screen get leukapheresis, where um, androgen presenting cells are collected at a, a blood center. Those are shipped off to um, the uh, company that manufactures this therapy. And there, these um, androgen presenting cells are um, pulsed with a fusion protein of prostatic acid phosphatase and GMCSF. Those activated cells are then uh, shipped back to the treating oncologist's office where the patient refuse, or receives those cells as an infusion. This entire process takes three or four days to do. It's repeated every <coughs> two weeks, three times. Um, and the idea is that we're stimulating these antigen presenting cells to attack prostate cancer cells, but I'd argue that the exact mechanism of action is not known. The trial that led to its approval is shown here, and it was a randomized trial of men um, with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic metastatic disease, and they were randomized to s actually getting Sapula cell T or to a quote unquote placebo. And in the placebo arm, those men had cells collected and two-thirds of those cells were frozen. They received one-third of the cells back as an infusion. And then men were followed for progression and treated subsequently at um, the physician's discretion. Primary endpoint was overall survival. And that result's shown here on this screen. You can see Sapula cell T improved um, the median overall survival from 21.7 months with placebo to 25.8 months um, in the treatment arm. And so this was a statistically significant result, but there was no impact on secondary endpoints in terms of PSA responses or progression-free survival. So, you know, with that, you know, this treatment um, provides um, challenges, I think, for patients and treating physicians alike, right? Because you like to see that your treatment sort of impacts on PSA, because we think that might be a barometer for the disease and how it's doing. And then also this is immune-based therapy. So all of the subsequent therapies that we talk about involve prednisone or steroids, which can be immune suppressing. So it provides challenges, I think, for patients who are expecting some type of response. And then it's challenging for treating physicians because how do you time this with the other therapies that are available? So personally, I consider this really for patients who are really high functioning or asymptomatic, minimally symptomatic, and have, um, um, you know, more indolent disease, not like as you were ex expressing earlier, more rapid changes okay. to their imaging. And really, <coughs> I follow the criteria for the trial that led to its approval. So patients are really without any visceral disease, and they really haven't had prior chemotherapy for at least three months, and no steroids for at least a month. So before we even leave this topic, mm -hmm. uh, do you see uh, next generations of this approach? I mean, this is a modest but significant improvement, but yeah. can you and your, your colleagues uh, imagine improved immunotherapies? Yeah, I think that this has opened up this tumor type to the notion that immunotherapy may have a role in this disease. And there are other ones that okay. are in development. So there's an antibody called ipilimumab, which is an antibody to a molecule CTLA-4, which is involved with immune regulation. And those are in, uh, or that drug is in, uh, involved in large phase three trials currently. There's another um, vaccine called Prostvac, and that too is in um, development in a phase three trial now okay. currently. So there are others that are in development. Um, and it may be that it's a class effect in terms of not really impacting on PSA or the measurable progression of the disease that it's acting in the background. We don't understand how exactly this immune therapy is working okay. or how to measure whether or not it's working. I think another thing to point on this slide is visceral disease. You know, that tends to be a group of men where we think may have a more aggressive feature or um, history to their disease. Um, and so those men with, um, you know, lots of visceral disease, not so much um, PSA production, 
classically, maybe some neuroendocrine features on histology. Those men we sort of think more towards chemotherapy. Um, and I would less, um, be less inclined to treat them with Cipula LT. Okay, that's excellent. Um, now, abiraterone, which is an um, um, androgen biosynthesis inhibitor, has also been studied in this pre-docetaxel setting. Um, I just wanted to touch on that data briefly. Um, this has been presented recently at the large ASCO meeting earlier this year. And abiraterone, as we talked about before, inhibits androgen production, not only within the testicles, but also within the adrenal glands. And we think tumor cells themselves are generating androgens. And so this um, trial was looking at men also asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic who yet to receive um, docetaxel, but um, had metastatic castration resistant disease. They had a good performance status zero or one in terms of an ECOG scale, and they were randomized to abiraterone um, uh, and prednisone, or to placebo and prednisone. And it had a dual primary endpoint, overall survival and progression-free survival, as well as a number of secondary endpoints that I listed at the bottom. And here's their primary endpoint, and that is um, progression-free survival. And this was measured in terms of either progression on a bone scan um, progression in terms of lesions that are measured on a CT scan or um, death. And so um, what you can see here is that the progression-free survival was not reached in the um, abiraterone arm, shown in yellow, um, but was about 8.3 months for the placebo arm, shown in white. And this difference was statistically significant. So this was a positive study. Its other primary endpoint, um, overall survival, is shown here. And again, there's a slight trend um, towards improving overall survival with this drug given pre-chemotherapy. So um, this may be an option for men in the near future. It's not yet, has, it is yet to receive an FDA indication pre-chemotherapy. Um, currently, its indication is post-docetaxel. Once again, Gary, this would be for men with primarily bony metastases, in your opinion, or are you playing that, or thinking about that perhaps a little differently? Yeah, I think that this would be for men um, pre, it, this day, this patients for this trial would be primarily men who, um, the key feature would be that they have a very good performance status, okay. good fitness, high functioning, and really not much um, in the way of symptoms. Okay. Yeah. So this gentleman, he elects to get treatment with Cipula LT, and six months later, his PSA continues to climb. And um, he has on his imaging um, new skeletal lesions, but no visceral metastases. And then he's starting to experience back and rib pain that's thought to be disease related and is requiring opioids for pain control. So here he's progressing both or all in terms of his PSA based on radiographic imaging and then clinically in terms of symptoms. So I'd ask the audience now, you know, what option would they choose? And we have the same. Um, treatment options listed as we've had before, a clinical trial, observation, so maintaining the status quo, um, moving with more secondary hormonal therapies, and then thinking about Cipulis LT, docetaxel, cabazitaxel, abiraterone, enzalutamide, or radium-223. While we're waiting for the report, does Cipulis L tend to be pretty uh, well tolerated? Yeah, it is. Um, so guys can have um, sort of what I call flu-like symptoms or infusion-related reactions. So maybe a fever, some um, shaking chills when they get the infusion of the cells. Those tend to be short-lived and at most tend to um, last a day or two. Um, there's not much in the way of lingering side effects with that treatment. So a good treatment option for men who are otherwise asymptomatic, high functioning. Okay. Um, there were a low number of strokes seen in that study, but in both the placebo and the treatment arm, so unclear whether or not that's a treatment-related effect. So once again, it's a clear decision that docetaxel is the, the audience's choice here. Yeah, and that would be in agreement with the NCCN guidelines, which are shown here, that men who are symptomatic um, with metastatic castration-resistant uh, prostate cancer the category one uh, recommendation would be uh, docetaxel. Other options are listed below, so mitoxantrone, abiraterone, and that would be based on the data that I had just shown you. 
um, but it's yet to receive an indication for that uh, use. And then palliative radiation or um, thinking about a radionuclide uh, treatment for men with symptomatic bone metastases, and finally a clinical trial. So these are the results of the large TAX 327 uh, trial, um, which were published in the New England Journal several years ago. And this was a study that led to docetaxel getting um, an indication for men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. And really the arm to pay attention to is arm one, and that was men who received uh, docetaxel every three weeks. And you can see the median survival there is 18.9 months, which was uh, a statistically significantly improved over the third arm, all the way to the right, which was with mitoxantrone. And mitoxantrone was the prior, um, uh, probably the prior standard of care um, uh, before docetaxel became available. But note too that um, this agent also seems to result in improvements in pain responses um, aside from you know, um, improving survival and PSA responses. Um, so it does seem to have quality of life benefits in addition to um, survival benefits. Gary, the survival benefits are small. Yeah. So could you uh, comment on that? Yeah, you know, it, I have a slide um, in, uh, later on in this uh, presentation that sort of highlights that. Right. You know, each of these have a small improvement, an uh, incremental improvement in survival. Um, perhaps together um, we're right. really meaning, you know, meaningfully extending life. And another question here is, uh, would you consider multimodal therapy, radiation, let's say, to the bone lesion? Does that play a role in your thinking at this point? Yeah, um, so um, thinking of these options, um, radiation to bone um, um, would be a reasonable option. In, in conjunction with those attacks all Yeah, so we might do that if um, people have a particular bone okay. lesion that's, um, that's what I was getting um, at. bothering them. But I also like to be careful about radiating a lot of bone lesions um, in that a number of these lesions tend to be along the axial skeleton, right. you know, along the spine or pelvis, which are areas where men, you know, have bone marrow. And you need a bone marrow reserve um, for some of the myelosuppressive effects of these therapies. So we like to preserve that as much right. as possible. Good point. Um, but um, getting to that point, you know, is there has been um, recent data shown with alpha radin or radium-223, um, which is a radiopharmaceutical. Um, and this is a molecule that gets taken up specifically at bone lesions. Okay. And um, this was studied um, in a large phase three trial shown here um, in which nearly a thousand men who had symptomatic disease um, but no visceral disease um, and these men were either previously treated with docetaxel or they were felt to be unfit for docetaxel. So some of these men were pre-chemotherapy, a bulk of them were post-chemotherapy. Um, and then they were randomized to um, radium-223 or to placebo. And the primary endpoint was overall survival. And that primary endpoint is shown here. Um, now, this is the data that was initially presented um, in 2011 at the ESMO conference in Europe. Um, and updated data was sh presented in this country a few months ago. And the median overall survival, I believe, improved from what's shown here, 14.9 or 14 months to 14.9 months. So a 3.6 month improvement in overall survival. So this drug not only um, Im resulted in improvement in survival outcomes, but it also uh, was shown to delay the time to skeletal related events. So a pathologic fracture, spinal cord compression, having an area of bone that you needed to act on, either okay. with radiation or surgery. And um, those get into quality of life as well. So this drug too seems to impact not only on survival outcomes, but quality of life as well. Well tolerated, um, some myelosuppression, um, but not uh, terrible, um, and then some GI toxicity as well. So our, that drug, radium-223, is not yet commercially available, okay. not yet FDA approved. So our patient, he proceeded after Sepulis LT with getting treated with docetaxel, and his PSA decreased from 45 to 15, and his pain improved. After about six cycles, though, his PSA starts rising, um, although 
a small amount, um, and he's having um, new pain, and on imaging has been found to have um, new bone lesions. So what would you do at this point? Would you uh, think about a clinical trial, um, think about observation, um, other hormonal therapy, think about Sepula cell T, docetaxel, cabazitaxel, abiraterone, enzalutamide, or radium-223? Clinical trial is always high on your list. Well, if I put these in the order that they're listed in the NCC. And guidelines. I think that's an important <laughs> point. But are there ways, and can you imagine ways that clinical trials will be even more available to the community uh, mm -hmm. clinicians uh, than they are maybe today? Is there, is there a, a well, I move afoot to do that? Yeah, I think that um, in the community, trials are more available than they um, have been in the past. Okay. Um, certainly, the bulk of patients are treated in the community as opposed to uh, right. larger academic centers. Um, and it just it costs money to put these studies on and to conduct them and to right. uh, manage these patients that are on studies. So really, it's, um, there are several barriers to that. Well. Clinical trials, 18%, abiraterone, 64%. Okay. So the NCCN uh, guidelines would be um, in, con um, in parallel with that. Um, so the options of men who have been treated with docetaxel um, per the NCCN are listed here. And they would include abiraterone, which we discussed the pre-docetaxel data, and then cabazitaxel. Um, other chemotherapy, rechallenging patients with docetaxel, mitoxantrone, thinking about other hormonal therapies, maybe one uh, that patients have yet to uh, be treated with. Sepula cell T might be an option for a select group of men, and then uh, a clinical trial. How might Sepulosa LT be an option for, what, what select group yeah. are we talking about? So we talked about that briefly um, I mean, post, or in the last oh, session. Okay. So, you know, the, um, the trial that led to its approval included about 15% of guys that were um, previously treated with docetaxel. Okay. So chemotherapy is not an exclusion for it. For immunotherapy. Yeah, but really, um, we'll I would be the goal here. Well, so it's not, um, it doesn't seem to impact, you know, PSA. It doesn't seem to slow down the rate of the progression of the disease. It doesn't seem to um, delay the time to other therapy. So it's not a palliative okay. treatment. It's not exciting. It would be. The... It would be for someone who is, you know, um, high performing after docetaxel or other chemotherapy, and really without symptoms. Okay. And those men do exist, um, but they are a minority of right. men in this um, setting. Um, so this is the data that led to abiraterone actually getting FDA approved, and its current indication is for men who have been previously treated with docetaxel. And in this trial included nearly 1,200 um, men who had progressive um, metastatic disease, and they had to have been treated um, with at least uh, one prior regimen, so one or two regimens, but at least one of those regimens had to contain docetaxel. So all of these men had been previously treated with docetaxel, and then their performance status could be zero to two. And they were randomized to abiraterone and prednisone or to placebo and prednisone, very similar to the earlier study we discussed. The primary endpoint was overall survival, and then the secondary endpoints are listed here. The overall survival and the primary endpoint of the trial is shown here, and you can see that um, abiraterone improved overall survival from 10.9 months with placebo to 14.8 months with abiraterone. And this was true whether people had one or two prior chemotherapy regimens. So exciting, yet another option that seems to impact on survival in a statistically significant way. This is a well-tolerated agent. The toxicity um, is sort of highlighted below in that box on the lower left. And um, you can see the main toxicity is fluid retention, hypokalemia, and hypertension. And it's thought that this is a result of the way that abiraterone works can result in um, hyperaldosteronism. And so as a result, people can waste potassium, retain fluid, develop higher blood pressure. So these need to be monitored going forward when you treat patients with abiraterone. And it is also the reason why prednisone is given with this agent 
it's to um, um, ameliorate or abrogate the, that toxicity. Okay. So um, now let's just review briefly the data that led to cabazitaxel getting approved um, in prostate cancer. So this is a study of that agent, and it was studied in men previously treated with docetaxel. And um, these men also had to have a decent performance status, zero to two. They were randomized to cabazitaxel given 25 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks, together with prednisone, or to mitoxantrone at the standard dose of 12 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks, also with prednisone. Primary objective of this study was overall survival, as was the case in the other trials we've reviewed, and the secondary objectives are listed here. So the primary endpoint is shown here, and this is a trial that was also positive. Mitoxantrone yielded a median overall survival of 12.7 months, and cabazitaxel um, just over 15 months, and this difference was um, statistically significant. Um, it's important to note that with this study, um, there were a few treatment-related deaths in both arms, more in the cabazitaxel arm. There, was more, or there were more patients with um, significant neutropenia and febrile neutropenia, as well as significant diarrhea in the cabazitaxel arm versus mitoxantrone. So it's important that these patients who get treated with cabazitaxel that they're monitored um, in terms of um, myelosuppression, in particular neutropenia, as well as um, GI toxicity, and that they're given a, um, appropriate supportive care. My own practice is that if patients are um, at particularly high risk, so like an elderly person, um, for neutropenic complications, we might just start them out with growth factor um, to avoid that scenario um, to begin with. Let me just interject uh, and remind the audience that I really would appreciate any questions you have that we could uh, provide to Gary as we go along. Now, the, another trial that's important to uh, review in uh, thinking about men who've been previously um, treated with um, docetaxel is the AFFIRM trial. And that's shown here. And this was the study that led to the approval of um, enzalutamide. So enzalutamide is also hormonal therapy, but it's um, targeting the androgen receptor directly. So it's sort of a next generation androgen uh, receptor inhibitor. It's um, thought to be superior to what we've had available previously in preclinical models. It's had activity in models that are resistant to bicalutamide. Um, it seems to bind with greater affinity to the androgen receptor than biclutamide, and it also prevents the androgen receptor from getting to the nucleus and binding to uh, DNA, so it seems to have additional um, actions. So in this study, it, was, um, it included nearly 1,200 patients with um, progressive uh, metastatic disease, and these are all men that have been previously treated with docetaxel. And they were randomized to enzalutamide, 160 milligrams a day, or to a placebo. And then they were followed um, in terms of um, a primary endpoint of overall survival. It's important to note that in this trial, steroids were not required. Some of the patients did receive prednisone, but unlike the prior studies that we've discussed, um, these men did not receive prednisone. So the primary endpoint is shown here. And this drug uh, yielded an improvement in overall survival from 13.6 months with placebo to over 18 months with enzalutamide. And this was a difference that was statistically significant. This drug, like abiraterone, um, is well tolerated. Um, there is, um, um, its toxicity profile seemed to be very favorable. Um, However, there were a few um, patients who experienced a seizure on the treatment arm, and there were none, as I understand it, on the placebo arm. So it raises the question whether or not this is a real signal and something that we'll have to pay close attention to now that this drug is um, FDA approved and commercially available. But if you look at the bottom line of this um, um, slide here from an ASCO presentation, um, each of these are um, five patients at the time of this presentation that had had a seizure. 
but it, at the bottom you can see that there were confounding factors um, that potentially could be responsible for these seizures. So it's unclear um, what the true risk of a seizure is um, on this agent, but something that we need to pay attention to going forward. So really, we've gone over several um, agents that are now available post-docetaxel, cabazitaxel, enzalutamide, um, abiraterone, um, and soon radium-223. And so it's going to be difficult to figure out what to choose. In fact, let me, let me ask a question that just came in and it's saying, what is salvage chemotherapy? So salvage chemotherapy would be um, uh, chemotherapy um, that um, really hasn't been shown to improve overall survival, but you were hoping to get um, some type of palliative benefit out okay, of it. Okay, so salvage and palliation are linked. Yeah, I would, I would think That's of it something beyond it. an initial um, um, first or second line of therapy um, and you were trying to achieve um, you know, a, a goal of maybe disease control, hopefully some sort of survival benefit, but really you're trying to palliate symptoms. Okay. Um, so how are we going to choose therapy for these men post-docetaxel? And really, um, you know, the genetics question was a good one. You know, currently we're really not in a position to personalize this very much. And really all we have to go on are clinical considerations. So ones that I would consider, um, and you have brought up sort of in our discussion along the way, would be, you know, someone's fitness, um, whether or not they're having symptoms, um, the burden of their disease, how rapidly their disease is changing. Thinking about comorbidities, so patients with uh, a seizure history or a cardiac history may impact on our choice of hormonal therapy or chemotherapy drugs. Certainly patient preferences are going to come into play. You know, um, I think that patients and physicians alike would like to delay chemotherapy for as long as possible, although I would argue that chemotherapy is the right drug for some patients. And then cost and logistics of treatment also should weigh into our decisions. So right now, primarily clinical considerations would determine our choice of therapy. You know, changing gears, um, I wanted to just touch base on sort of a supportive aspect and one we talked about a little bit in the prior um, session, and that is, you know, what do we recommend to patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer um, who have bone metastases? Let me, before we mm -hmm. ask that, let me, uh, w it says, would you use anti for patients who have castration-resistant prostate cancer and treatment failure on abiroterone and by colutamide and not candidates for docetaxel? Yeah, so I think what that question is getting at is would we use it pre-chemotherapy? Okay. So um, like abiraterone, there is a large trial uh, called the PREVAIL trial with um, enzalutamide that's being um, 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 conducted in the pre-docetaxel um, setting. Um, and we don't have results of that yet. Abiraterone, um, I have been using in my own practice for some men pre-chemotherapy, primarily if for some reason they're not a candidate for docetaxel. I hope that enzalutamide also finds an, a home in that space as well, um, but we'll have to wait and see. Here's another question. Are you aware of any data that would support either abironorin or enzalutamide, docetaxel or cabazitaxel in a uh, metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer scenario as combination therapy for patients with aggressive disease? Yeah, that too is a good question um, and one that we'll probably be touching upon in uh, subsequent sessions today. And that is, you know, not only how to sequence these agents, but should we be combining them? Um, I have um, my men that have been on abiraterone prior to docetaxel. Um, we have, in a couple of cases, continued abiraterone while they received docetaxel. Um, but currently, understand the FDA indications are that these drugs are used separately. Um, combinations um, would be something that we'd have to work out going forward. Here's another question from a OC nurse who says, I've treated several patients with uh, cabazitaxel in their early 60s. And they were in good health status, but they developed life-threatening diarrhea. And let me just summarize this. Have you found any antidiarrheal agents that work better 
for these men. Uh, and if the patient has had a good response with this drug, would you consider continuing this therapy despite the high grade level of diarrhea with home fluid support and anti-diarrheal agents? Um, I would say that if, um, I think that's an excellent question because she's um, highlighting um, one of the, one side, of, effects, one of the right. side effects that we have to pay attention to. Um, um, typically what we do is we manage, um, I've not had anybody with um, really significant diarrhea right. on this agent, um, but what we have done for some patients is manage them as we do other agents um, that can cause diarrhea. Um, and that would be with, you know, Imodium um, or um, other anti-diarrheal agents. Um, certainly if they're having significant number of bowel movements and whatnot, you, you have to support them with IV fluids and whatnot. And would you, would you uh, be willing to re-initiate? So would you re-challenge them is, a, is also a good point. You know, if someone has a life-threatening... Sounds like it's not it, a great idea. It sounds like it's not a great idea. All right, let's uh, move on to this uh, important area of bone metastasis. So, and um, a question I have for the audience is what they would recommend for men with metastatic castration resistant disease and um, bone metastases. So do you put um, your men only on um, calcium with vitamin D? Um, do you start them on zoledronic acid? Do you give them um, a newer agent, denosumab, um, maybe a combination of A and B or a combination of A and C? A and C is uh, the winner in this category. Yeah, um, so the NCCN recommendations would say that um, either uh, would be a reasonable choice. Um, both, there's level one data to support either uh, denosumab or zoledronic acid, but a point that I would want to highlight is that they also recommend that uh, men be on calcium and vitamin D in addition to either one of the agents. Um, because either agent can result in, particularly denosumab, can result in hypocalcemia. All right. So men should be on calcium while receiving these agents, not only for bone health, but to avoid toxicity. Um, and then the NCCN also uh, recommends screening and treating for osteoporosis um, based on um, um, uh, characteristics listed at the bottom there in terms of risk for um, osteoporotic-related uh, fractures. Here's a question that says, what is denosumab? So denosumab is a rank ligand inhibitor. It's an antibody to uh, rank ligand, which is thought to be involved with um, the vicious cycle of uh, crosstalk between tumor cells, osteoclasts, and osteoblasts in the bone microenvironment, which results ultimately in um, bone destruction, leading to problems with bone metastases. And so uh, denosumab uh, interrupts um, a signaling agent rank uh, ligand um, and tries to shut down that whole crosstalk. Is it pretty well tolerated? Yeah, um, so I have the data here okay. in terms of um, what um, resulted in its approval. Um, and denosumab, particularly in prostate cancer, was compared directly to zoledronic acid in a large randomized trial shown here. Um, and it was men with castration-resistant disease who had bone metastases. And these men had not seen a prior bisphosphonate. And it included nearly 2,000 men. And they were randomized to either denosumab or to zoledronic acid. And men also received a placebo because denosumab is um, given as a subcutaneous injection. Zoledronic acid is an IV infusion. So that people didn't know what they were getting, they sort of got a dummy of both. The primary endpoint of the trial uh, was the time to a first uh, on-study skeletal-related event. And that uh, data is shown here. And you can see that um, denosumab, um, its time to a first skeletal-related event was 20.7 months versus zoledronic acid, 17.1 months. So denosumab was superior in terms of delaying the time to a first skeletal-related event. So again, what we're talking about here is, you know, worst case scenario, you know, like a spinal cord compression or a pathologic fracture, but also just an area of bone that you may need to radiate because okay. of pain. So this is impacting on quality of life. 
It's important to note, though, that even though the drug extended the time to a first skeletal-related event, there was really no difference in terms of overall survival or progression of the disease between the two arms. Okay. Um, generally, denosumab is fairly well tolerated. Um, um, the two side effects that we need to discuss is one, the rate of hypocalcemia. Um, that is, uh, can be a problem with this agent, as it can be with zoledronic acid, but it seems to be more so of a problem with denosumab. And um, so all men receiving denosumab should also be on supplemental calcium. Its other um, risk, and it's also a risk with um, zoledronic acid, is osteonecrosis of the jaw. So we need to pay attention to dentition in men that are being uh, treated um, to make sure that they're not at risk for developing that complication. So this was a slide I had mentioned earlier in um, our presentation today. And you're right, um, um, if I can be so forward, you know, none of these agents is a home run. Um, and so shown here are all the agents that we have thus far that have improved overall survival. Note uh, the radium-223 at the bottom is not yet FDA approved. And actually the most recent data suggests an improvement in overall survival of 3.6 months. So each of these seems to improve overall survival incrementally, but has been shown to do so in a large phase three trial. Um, so maybe from the standpoint of you know, an additive um, effect of these medicines, we are extending survival more significantly as patients roll from one treatment to the next. Here's a question, Gary, and it says, how do you manage hot flashes? Yeah. It's <laughs> a practical but important question. Yeah, so, so um, the first thing I do is ask patients, you know, do, um, uh, do they bother you? Because, um, you know, men will tell, many of my patients will tell me about hot flashes, but then they're not really wanting to be on yet another medicine to manage uh, hot flashes. And um, so we tend to just watch them, and a number of patients. But in men that we're going to actually treat, uh, things that we think about um, would be a Fexor, uh, sometimes a low dose of Megase. Um, okay. And um, there's also some herbal remedies, like a, an herbal remedy, a black cohosh, that people have tried. Here's a comment that I think is interesting, and uh, the gentleman says that he's noticed the improved compliance with denosumab versus uh, zoronic acid because of the side effects. Would you concur with that, that people are more, that the outcome Maybe. could be better because people Maybe. are willing to? Um, I mean, um, the, uh, you know, why would you choose one over the other? Right, that's I'm what not he's sure alluding. that, um, 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 everyone would say that, you know, 20 months versus 17 months to a time to a skeletal related event means you should use denosumab because there probably are cost differences. Um, but um, denosumab is um, not, it's not reliant on the, on the kidneys to be cleared and zoledronic acid uh, does and can rarely result in kidney damage. So um, patients with renal impairment, denosumab may be an advantage. But with these um, oral agents, you know, it's easy to give someone denosumab as a sub-Q injection. You don't have to start an IV. Um, denosumab can have um, some infusion-related uh, reactions with it, so uh, maybe low-grade temperatures, aches and pains, and denosumab seems to have less of um, a likelihood of doing that. So here's a, a suggestion, and it says one-time shot of depot provera solves hot flashes. You may want to comment on that. And another question says, how do you manage breast tenderness um, with um, with bacomutamide, do you pre-treat everyone? I think what they mean pre-treatment in terms to of prevent the palliative yeah, radiation, right. and we don't typically you don't. That's do that. That's what I thought. Yeah, we yeah. don't typically do that. Um, we have done it in a few cases for men that are particularly concerned about it, but generally that's not something that we do. I've not tried Depo-Provera for hot flashes. Well, well, we'll see what the audience thinks on that. It's nice that we got yeah. that uh, input. Um, so it looks to me like there's important high-level evidence mm -hmm. that we're making progress. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for the audience and our patients to know. And then secondly, uh, the field is moving towards perhaps combinations of therapy or rethinking some of the strategies for how to sequence these drugs. Yeah. And, and I like the way you're thinking because you're looking at different targets, the immune system and 
receptors and yeah, I you know, think it's, that a, it's not a home run, but it's certainly, uh, in my opinion, a, a lot of steps in the right direction. Correct. Um, I think it's an exciting time in that we have finally in this disease uh, multiple options for men, multiple options that seem to impact not just on survival, but quality of life measures. Um, and now we have, you know, a bunch of challenges in front of us in terms of, as you know, an earlier question, how do we begin to combine these agents? Um, and, you know, how do we choose one of these agents, particularly post-docetaxel, where there's several choices, how do we begin to choose one agent over another for a particular patient? I hate to bring up the subject of cost, but does that have any bearing on the community's thinking as you look at all these agents with some having fairly similar benefits? Yeah, um, these are all expensive treatments, right? Okay. They're all new, <laughs> all right. um, and they're all you know a few thousand dollars a month. Um, so it's um, costly, but um, you know as long as you're using them in their FDA indication, you know third-party payers should be covering these. And do you see any new categories that are going to be popping up? aside from the ones that we're focusing on areas of, of targeting? Um, you mean in terms of drugs? Yes. Any, yeah. I mean, so new we'll have a, a, a session at the end of the today um, does focus on things that are in development, but there's a number of um, phase three trials um, looking at various targets. Um, and it's an exciting time, I think, in prostate cancer now that um, we're developing a lot of different medicines um, in this disease. I just want to check and make sure we have no, um, here, how about different drugs being synthesized given that the prostate cancer can arise from different genetic m mutations? <laughs> That's so interesting. I guess, I guess that, yeah. that too is getting at personalizing this, right. uh, these therapies and, you know, we're not there just yet, but hopefully we are in the future as people are working on that. So Gary, I really want to thank you for joining us. It's been a very informative yeah. session, and I'm sure the audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. I'd like to thank the following companies who've been able to support this educational initiative. Abbott, Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals, and Algeta US. Please remember to complete the quiz at the end of the session to secure your CME credits. My name is Dr. Anthony Schaefer. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Gary. Yeah, thank you for having me.